All right, so in this video, let me illustrate the main big picture concepts behind using RNNs for sequence generation. In particular, we will be briefly talking about many to many RNNs for generating texts. So recall this figure here that I showed you a couple of weeks ago when we talked about recurrent neural networks for text classification. So we had this slide on the different types of sequence modeling tasks. And previously we used this many to one approach where we had a text input, so many inputs, and had one output a sentiment label whether the movie review was positive or negative. So it was essentially a classifier and the classifier worked on a word level. So we had an embedding vector that took each word as an input and was converting it into a, yeah, into a continuous vector. Today we are going to focus on the many-to-many -many architecture for generating texts. So there's also a related many-to-many -many architecture here. This could be, for instance, used for language translation. And we will talk a little bit more about language translation when we talk about RNNs with attention. But in this video, we are going to focus on the many-to-many -many approach first. That is really like taking one input and producing one output at each time step. So and when we talk about generating texts, with recurrent neural networks. There are two main approaches. One is a so-called character level RNN, also just known as character RNN, and a word level RNN, which we also just call word RNN. And the difference is really uh, what we provide as token, as one input token. So focusing on the left um, subfigure here, so for let's say a word RNN, we could have uh, one word would be the input. So for each time step here, the input would be a single word. For instance, um, let's say I like um, hiking. And when we train this word RNN, what we want to do is we want to predict during training the next word. So let's say I like hiking a lot or something. We have a sentence that would continue like this, hiking a lot. So what we would do is in the first time step, we have this I as input and it should predict like. And then second input is like, it should predict or output hiking. And then I input is I hiking and then it should provide an A. Um, and then so forth. So we would continue like that. So we provide one word as input and then it should learn how to predict the next word. This is usually how a word level RNN is trained. For the character level RNN, it's um, trained slightly differently, but following the same concept. Let me erase that. So instead of uh, giving one word as an input at each position, we would just use one character. So for example, I then space, like, an L, and so forth. So in that way, um, it predicts one character at a time. So we would predict the next character. So I, if I have I like hiking, so I would be the first word, and it predicts the, the white space here. And then the next one would be the white space, and then the L, and then the L and the next letter would be the I and so forth. So fundamentally, yeah, the difference is between using a word and a, or a character level RNN. At the end of this video, I have just a small comparison slide, like uh, listing the advantages and disadvantages of using each of those two approaches. So let's um, focus for now maybe on the character RNN. And I will tell you at the end of this uh, video what the advantages are of using a character RNN and what the advantages are of using a word RNN. So, but for simplicity, we are focusing now on the character RNN, not on the word RNN. So now assume we have this character RNN. This is uh, for training, we predict the next word. And if we have a sentence like that, uh, we know the next label, right? Because we have this um, letter and then we know all the following letters. In that way, it is 
It is a flavor of self-supervised learning where we generate our labels. So we don't have to have labels for this training task because the labels are essentially the structure of the sentence, right? Because we, we know the next word and um, here the prediction is essentially the next word. I will have another slide that maybe makes this a little bit more clear. So for now, stay with me. So what we are doing here is we are always providing the next word as input during training. Oh, sorry, the next character. But for testing, so how do we then generate new text with that, right? So we want to generate a new text and not just regenerate an existing text. So how we do that is we provide a random letter as input then it pro uh, predicts the next letter. Usually there's also some sampling involved. We are sampling with a certain probability. So we would consider all the top predicted letters, let's say the uh, with a certain probability, and then we would randomly sample, do a weighted sampling of these predicted letters, and then use that letter as the input for the next one. And then again, we predict characters and we take one of them and provide them as input to the next position and so forth. And with that we can um, yeah, predict different or generate different characters and sequences. And uh, I think this will also become more clear when we take a look at the code example. So essentially the network learns the probability that certain letters occur after each other. And if we train it like that, it will at some point be able to yeah to generate realistic text with a certain amount of yeah spelling errors but uh, yeah we will see about that in the code example to make this concept a little bit more clear i have a slightly different slide here that is maybe a little bit more i would say concrete so this is a character rnn here again and just assume it's processing the text test. So it's trained to predict the next character. So here I have the inputs. First one is T, then E, and then S. And these letters are represented as a one-hot encoding. So for the letter T, the last position is a one. For the letter E, the first. And for the letter S, it's the center position. Here we have only a one-hot encoding vector of three elements. But the number of elements here, the size of this, would be equal to the number of possible characters. So for instance, if we only would consider all lowercase English alphabet letters, it would be, let's say, 24. If we consider lower and uppercase, it would be 48. Um, then if we have punctuation like period, comma, colon, semicolon, it would be 52 and so forth. So the size of the uh, one hot encoding vector here really depends on how many characters we consider. And this size here of this um, one hot encoding vector is equal to the size of the output here. So the output layer, this uh, what's shown here is a vector of the predicted softmax probabilities. So these are the probabilities, the predicted probabilities for each letter. So in this case, Position one was um, the letter E, right? So it has 70% probability that this is an E, 20% that this is an S, and 10% that this is a T. The correct letter is an E. So in this case, the network is making good prediction. So because the highest probability is the correct letter. For the second one, so it receives an E, it should predict an S. So the probability that this is an E is 20%. The probability that this is a this is an S is 60% and the probability that this is an T is 20%. So also in this case, the highest probability is for the is corresponding to the correct letter. So that's also good. And for the last one, yeah, this is also good. So this is of course just a toy example, but here essentially the network is trained to output a high probability for the correct word. And then we can use the argmax to convert this back into a letter from going from this um, probability here to uh, to the actual letter, we could, for example, uh, use an argmax. So it would give us the index, uh, index corresponding to, to the letter in, let's say, uh, a vector or dictionary. 
A um, few more things. So usually, yeah, we, we use an embedding layer. We have talked about this in the RNN classification lecture. We use usually an embedding layer to uh, embed the inputs. So there's usually a certain dimensionality of that embedding that comes out of it. And then we also usually choose the size of the hidden layer. And here it just happens that the hidden layer has three values, but it's yeah, just a coincidence because it fit nicely here into this box. But of course, this hidden dimension is arbitrary. It's good. It could be, for example, 64, 128, or 200, 211, whatever you like. It's, this is similar to the um, RNN for classification. So, so these parts are really the same that we have seen before when we talked about RNN classifiers. The new part is really that the output here is um, a softmax probability vector corresponding to the one hot encoding of the input. So essentially, yeah, we are trying to predict letters now rather than class labels. So the letters here are essentially our class labels. And in that sense, since we are predicting something that is in, in the data, it's kind of like yeah, kind of like self-supervised learning because we are generating our labels here ourselves by just yeah using the inputs, the text. Yeah, and this is yeah the, the broader concept. And like I mentioned before, um, during the generation, so once we train the network and when we use it for inference for generating new text, we sample we sample from, from this output vector here. So it's not guaranteed that we pick the letter E as input for the next token. That is after training during testing. Because if we would guarantee that, then of course it would just memorize text, but we want to usually have some variety in our text. So there's a certain probability. So the probability is 70% to sample that E, for example, whereas there's a smaller probability, let's say 20%, to also choose a different letter. So we can also, in practice, I mean, there are different ways. You can also say, only consider the top five letters or top three letters and sample them with a given probability and so forth. So there are different uh, ways for doing that. But yeah, during the generation of new text, we usually don't just pick the one with the highest probability. We usually pick the one with the highest probability most often, but we also occasionally pick another letter. And this will become hopefully more clear in the code example where we implement something like that. Yeah, so here are just, um, yeah, uh, for reference, what I talked about, how how we um, work with this character RNN. So during training, what we do is usually we ignore the prediction. I mean, the prediction is only used for computing the loss, but we don't, we don't during training feed it into here. During prediction, we take this from the original input text and um, during the inference stage, we usually then use the prediction as the next input. This allows us then to create text with a variety that it's not always the same text. Yeah, and I wanted to highlight, of course, this works with both word and character level RNNs. Um, we talked about character level RNNs when I showed you this, but of course, this would also work with word level RNNs. The difference though would be that the size here of this one hot encoding would be the same size as the number of words that can occur. If you consider the English vocabulary, there are millions of words usually, so you restrict that so that doesn't become too large. But even if you have a vocabulary, let's say of 20,000 words, it would be way larger than the number of characters, which is one of the challenges of working with word RNNs. So this wasn't a problem that much when we talked about the classifier, when we implemented the RNN classifier. Because, yeah, I mean, for the embedding, it still works fine if we have a 20,000 um, vocabulary size. But the problem is really when we have these outputs here, like um, we compute the label over these 20,000 um, possible words and compute the cross entropy between the two, right? That would be a little bit more... Um, challenging because these could be all very small values and there might be no large value among them and so forth. So there's a, there's a field of machine learning called energy-based uh, models, which kind of borrows ideas from physics, like how to make two vectors or how to assess whether or how similar two vectors are. But yeah, this is a, a 
a different topic for maybe a separate lecture. But the fact that in word level RNNs these vectors are very large, it's usually easier to train a character level RNN for generating new texts. So let me summarize um, things here. So for character embeddings, we usually only have the 24 letters if we consider lowercase only. If we have upper and lowercase as different letters, we would of course have uh, 48. And in general, it requires less memory compared to word embeddings. And um, it allows us also to have yeah, smaller output layers. The disadvantage of using character RNNs over word RNNs is that it can more easily yeah, create weird nonsense words because each character is uh, input, so it can put together weird character combinations that don't correspond to real words. Whereas if you were um, use a word level RNN, I mean, it can still have a weird word order, but each word is kind of fixed. So in that way, you don't at least have a spelling errors in the words. And one other disadvantage of character level RNNs is that they are worse at capturing long distance um, dependencies. That's simply because you have, well, we have more tokens, right? So if each character is a token, so if we have the sentence, I like hiking or something like that. So if I look at this, these are only two tokens apart if I consider them as words. But if I consider each character, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight sequence positions uh, are between these two. So in that way, it becomes more challenging to capture the relationship because this might get lost when we, even if we have an LSTM, these types of um, long sequence relationships might get lost. We will talk about the tension mechanism, which can help with longer sequences, but we will take a look at that in a word RNN context. For now, since it's the simpler case in the next video, I want to yeah, implement a character RNN in PyTorch because that's uh, also easier to train than a word RNN. And um, I will first show you maybe the concepts in the next video because there are also some, I would say, uh, technical details that are worth noting. So we'll first show you the big picture concepts, how to implement this using LSTMs and LSTM cells. And then I will show you in another video the actual code implementation.